email that I would be here. <laughs> Live with Kimberly Crossman. G'day, Kim. How are you, mate? I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, very well. I was just saying to you just before we started, I think this is, it is two o'clock on the dot. I think this is the first ever podcast I've done that's been spot on the time. So, so thank you. Are you a bit of a punctual girl? Is that one of your things? Yes, I am the most punctual, which is good. Well, yeah, I think I always grew up that if you're on time, you're late. So it's very good. Wow. But it also means that I've also um, developed a strong disdain for anyone who is late. And on top of that, if something holds me up, I get floods of anxiety if I'm in traffic or the fear of being late is incredibly overwhelming to me. So I have kind of pros I, and cons, like I, all things. I have two modes. Um, in the morning, like my very first appointment of the day, <coughs> pardon me, or like getting the kids to school or something like that, I'm always right on the barrier of being on time to late, only for the first okay. appointment. Then the rest of my day I describe as uh, usually on time, often early, never late. So yeah, I'm, right. I'm. That's how my kind of my kind of life runs in general. Um, does that? I mean, I, don't I, like, I don't like people waiting around for me. Like I feel. Like it's disrespectful. So <laughs> I try and always respect people's time. Oh, look, oh, look I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, no, 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 I'm with you. I think that people being late to something that you have set up, like come and meet me and then they're 20 minutes late or whatever, it's like they're actively telling me my time is more valuable than yours, so I'll just turn up when I like. I Look, I get it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that altogether. How does that impact you in the world of acting? Um, because I guess there's tight schedules, tight timetables. Is it something in there that, that helps you? Um, I mean, yeah, you definitely have to be on time for work um, because if not, then it is disrespectful. Usually actors are some of the last people on set, unless you are in makeup early. But yeah, it would be a bit of a power move, bit of a dick move if you show up late and then make everyone else's day suffer for it. So... That's not to say it doesn't happen. It does happen often, not with me, but yes. Um, yeah, I. it's a real trigger for me when people aren't punctual. And obviously when life and stuff happens, but I remember in an acting class in the States, people would show up like 20 minutes late with a fresh coffee in their hand. And it's yeah. just like, yeah, I think you, it, it, tell, it informs me so much more about that person or what's important to them. And yeah, I, I get... I feel like I get let down really easily. <laughs> Probably, I, I definitely create it into something bigger than it is. It's not personal, but I always take it personally. Well, but then if you've also got those people who are always late, when there's like a for real genuine reason why they're late, they've had car issues, or they don't get the credit for it. Because like, well, 99% of the time you're late anyway, this is just another reason that you're late. I had a friend when I was um, studying at university and we used to actively tell her we would be meeting half an hour before we were actually meeting. So, you know, if we're all going to get together at 9 o'clock, we'd tell her 8.30, and she'd still turn up at 9.30. And it was that kind of thing that she's a mate, and she got to a point where he's just never going to change her. So we adapted our <laughs> our lives to fit around her a little bit. Yeah, that's chaos. That would stress me out. I couldn't do that. <laughs> you're a good friend. If you say friends, that's quality. You're, you're a good one. You're a keeper, Pat. Yeah, oh, thanks. Um, I was wondering as well, you've had a pretty big uh, lockdown COVID time. Uh, a pretty mm -hmm. big birthday happened during the first lockdown, it looks like, if that was within that first lockdown, certainly close to it. Um, yeah, I had a birthday in the first in the first lockdown. I did lockdown in America, actually, to start um, my, uh, like, yeah, I was, I was overworking in the States, getting ready to do a film, and then uh, in early March, we kind of got locked down significantly earlier than I think you guys did, um, and then stayed over there, and then... Uh, came to New Zealand to come and shoot a couple of shows out here and then have kind of stuck around here because there's work here for me, which is really awesome. And yeah, and then I guess now gearing gearing up to decide uh, what I should do, I think uh, in all honesty, kind of, yeah, just deciding what, what happens November 3rd or November 6th, whenever the US election is, <laughs> I think that will that will definitely inform my decision of where I want to be primarily based. Um, personally, for me, I, I don't want to do another four years in America with Trump. Um, 
he just permeates every conversation every day in your life. And, you know, I know right now New Zealand feels very politically charged leading up to an election and, and obviously with COVID, but this has been like four years of every day, a new group of people feeling um, upset, enraged, rightfully so. And it's just, yeah, everyone is really stressed and angry and yeah, it's just, it's not, it's not pleasant to to live in that and I am an empath I take on everything so it just feels like every day is more shocking than the one preceding it which feels chaotic and I know I'm not reinventing the wheel with my opinion but yeah just it's it's not a nice place to be living in currently so. and I'm, I'm assuming if you're working in the world of acting and stuff you're based in and around Los Angeles and in, in California yeah I live in Santa Monica and I love it there it really is really beautiful um yeah, I mean, it's not New Zealand, obviously. Put that on the record before <laughs> people come at me. But yeah, it's definitely not New Zealand, but Santa Monica is is really lovely. It has a really cool vibe, a lot of um, transients there. So people coming and going. Um, it is far more diverse than some of the other areas I've lived in LA, which I love. Um, but yeah, America is an, it's a, like an interesting, it's like a relationship that I'm in with Los Angeles. You know, I was so infatuated with it at first and it, um, you know, it kind of treated me quite mean, which history tells me that's the perfect way to get my attention is to not give me any attention and then I'll just strangle it until I get it. Um, and yeah, now kind of falling out of love with it just because of the political climate. And yeah, trying to trying to see if I want to put in the work or a cut my losses it's also really inter healthier. interesting watching what's happening in america at the moment there seems to be some interesting political movements within california um i keep an eye on a lot of especially comedians going through um california and uh, there are a bunch of people kind of fleeing california and going to other parts of the country based around mm. taxes and new regulations coming in i think yesterday uber and lyft have been removed from California, so they're no longer um, active in California, and that's because legislation has come in looking for people to be employees. And so, of course, Uber and Lyft drivers aren't employees, which means they don't get the health benefits, but it means that there are uh, uh, another layer of people who were getting income from somewhere who are no longer getting it. It's, it's a fact. It's, I had someone once describe. In fact, I was talking to Steve Wrigley, who's living in a comedian in New Zealand. Yeah, who's living in uh, New York State, upstate at the moment. And he described America as being like Europe in that every state was sort of like an independent country. And so when you when you think about it like that, you can see how somewhere like California can be so different from Texas, which can be so different from Ohio, which can be so different from New York and how they operate. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Definitely is. So you've got enough. I, I was looking through your uh, your Wikipedia page and your bio, and you've been <laughs> super busy up until. That's a good. That's a good source of factual information. <laughs> well, I've. It's uh, interesting you'd say that. We did a we did a podcast once with New Zealand's only Wikipedian, and he he's like it's a it's a good place to get real information. When the Christchurch shootings happened, apparently news sources uh -huh. all over the world were coming to the. Wikipedia page in New Zealand about that to get all their information because the Wikipedia people working in it were uploading it very quickly. But but that being said, obviously um, people who participate in uploading stuff can upload incorrect information. But what I was going to say was you look to have been very, very busy up till 2019 and then obviously COVID has slowed things down. You, although you are multifaceted in your um, you know, acting and your presenting and your writing and also, you know, um, I'm involved with startups and stuff. How does mm -hmm. how does the year pan out for you, things like supporting yourself, income, when I, I'm, I'm assuming the, the place you would see most of your income come from kind of basically shuts down for a year? What happens? Yeah, um, actually, and I'm just going to touch wood, consider myself really fortunate. Um, this year has actually been a really good year for me for work. So I came back to work on two shows, which has turned into four shows. I did shoot a show for TV3, Dies House Party, in lockdown from my house. Right. And um, I've been working with Neon as well to create, um, we did quarantine with Kim, like daily lives during lockdown. So I've actually been working heaps this year. A lot of some of that stuff is obviously self-generated, but um, yeah, part of the reason to come back to work in New Zealand was that obviously that US stream of income has completely cut off because they're not allowed to shoot anything. They're not shooting anything. Mm. So uh, the decision to come back to, at the time, COVID-free New Zealand was uh, a very easy decision to make. Um, 
especially financially. I get really stressed about money. It's a huge uh, source of insecurity for me. Um, I have to remember that I chose spontaneity over, um, <laughs> um, oh, what, what is it called? What, uh, security? security, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I <laughs> often have to remind myself that I chose this life. Um, and it is definitely a feast or famine lifestyle. Um, I think part of kind of, I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety last year and part of my learning and diving into understanding and getting a better education around mental illness because I was very naive to it is that I go up with my ups and down with my downs and that's not an original thing. I'm real original take on it, Kim, the creative who <laughs> is riding the wave. Um, but there has to be a healthier way to go about it. And a lot of that is to do with finances. If I'm earning money, right. Right. I feel validated. I feel secure. I, you know, I'm not questioning big, crazy things, but when you do go through seasons of unemployment, which are part and the parcel of what I do for a living, um, it's very hard to not feel those feelings of I'll never work again, uh, imposter syndrome. What if, you know, it's all been luck and chance and yeah, no one will ever hire you. And when you're not having that validation from someone employing you with actual money, something tangible, then yeah, that can be quite stressful. So I totally relate to anyone who's going through one of those seasons in life right now. Very fortunate that I'm currently not in one of those seasons, but that's not to say in a month's time or two months time, you know, <laughs> when a job ends, you're right back there. So yeah. it's a, it's I don't a, know if you can speak to that. I'm sure, you know, you're, you, you're in this biz too. It's yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard wave to ride. And some people are able to do it really well. It's a crazy thing, um, kind of world to operate it as well. If you've had um, sort of depression and anxiety, um, mm -hmm. I guess not to speak to your experiences, I'll let you do that. But just thinking out loud, um, I I had to come to this place at some stage because I most of my career I've been in radio and um, worked on stage and done little bits and pieces here and there. But I realised there's a very fine line between doing something to get applause. And having applause being a byproduct of what you do and then you put on top of that it's difficult because getting applause is what secures my job now in radio it means ratings i mean it's a version of applause you know it's the numbers that are listening to you and if you're doing something uh independent if it's not picked up or worked with and and that that in itself innately i think for anyone not even someone with depression or anxiety issues can bring anxiety it's an anxious feeling and i remember having to come to yeah, probably in my 30s i had to come to a very um i had to come to a place where i where i made the applause the byproduct because very much i was focused on the applause and then that changes what you do so whilst it didn't lead me into like a diagnosed depression or anxiety i i get how how um fickle the industry on some levels i mean i'm not in the same industry as you but you know in media in general can be because yeah when you're reaching for success and success is determined on eyeballs or ears or perhaps in this modern age with digital things you know, inputs in the computer it can be a scary place to have to sit back and go now everyone else has control i've done my stuff and if they like it they like it and if they don't they don't i get it mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely it's definitely interesting. I, I wish that, and I am working to not get all my validation from from that. Um, <laughs> it's it is a big shift, though. I'm very goal oriented, but um, even in that, even in my achievements, I I'm not very good at being in the present and acknowledging an achievement. I'm on to the next thing. So, yeah, I someone said to me like yesterday it's you know your anxiety is in your future and your depression is in your past and i basically just flip flop between those right. two and i'm rarely present so um except obviously when i'm actually working or talking to you because you know my focus is laser focused so i'm here with you um but yeah so it, it would be a, a euphoric sense of being that i'm striving towards of creating a little bit more presence and, and not so result oriented and not so hung up on that employment being the source of my happiness and feeding my ego and yeah trying to trying to work on that which I think we all are no one's perfected it but yeah I definitely need to get my happiness would lie in a version of me that's 
it's at least better than I am at that currently. Well, then, and but then you're stuck in that cycle of you you need success in what you're doing, which needs those eyeballs. Uh, and I get it, mm. but I think you've said something really interesting, which I think it's it's weird to say it seems to be quite an easy solution because all of us are individuals and we find our easy things easily and our hard things are difficult. But I always find for me, I wouldn't call myself goal orientated, but I'm kind of content orientated. And I've just mm-hmm. come to the determination and it's very different from working for someone or, or reading someone else's script or working under someone else's rules in a radio station is I just make mm-hmm. what I like and I look for it to find an audience. So my mm-hmm. goal is for me to put out content and go, fucking awesome, I love this. And mm-hmm. typically what I find is there will be enough people who also go, oh my goodness, that's awesome. Like I've got a, I, I don't want to kind of release it too early because it's going to be probably, it's my most favorite podcast I'm looking forward to ever. And I've done, the, you, I think you're number 119 for this for this series. Um, I found a psychologist who deals with um, why when we think something and we get challenged that our thoughts are wrong, like, unequivocally challenged, like I thought the earth was flat, proven it's round, it's hard for us to change our position. And on top of that, he has an interest in why people ignore science. And I'm just like, in this day and age, hallelujah, what what kind of podcast would that be to put that information out there? Now, I'm so excited about that podcast, just like I'm excited to talk to you, just like I was excited to talk to, you know, the right Honourable Winston Peters yesterday, is that I'm just talking to people I want to talk to and having fun. Now, in a year's time, if that doesn't find enough content or enough return, then it will have to go away. But I'm determined just to have fun and do what I want to do and enjoy myself, and hopefully that can find a, an audience. Build it and they will come a little bit. So that's what yeah. I'm trying to do. Well, I full credit to you. You should be doing that. And I, I mean, I relate in the sense of doing my own podcast, having that sense of ownership and that that mine <laughs> yours sounds a little more noble mine came from uh just needing to talk to people and unless i turned my depression into a project i wouldn't have given it the time of day so it definitely had selfish intentions originally to help me help myself but uh yeah it, it's growing into something else which is really cool and i totally relate to that sense of ownership and the content it's yeah it doesn't have to go through a million people it's just through me and my own lens and that's really cool yeah yeah, and look, I'm, I'm not thinking that anything noble is coming out of the studio. Trust me, my favourite podcast at the moment is one called Two Bears, One Cave, which is two um, comedians, um, Tom Segura and Bert Kreischer. I love Tom Segura. Yeah. Have you seen Two Bears, One Cave? I haven't. I've seen, uh, I've heard about it. Yep. I haven't listened to it, but I will go listen to it because I, I really enjoy both of them. Tom's latest, or latest, or the one before Netflix special was one of my favourite um yeah, stand up hours. I think he's brilliant. I love them so much, and I love the podcast that they do to a point where it's almost annoying. I'm going to look up something while we're talking here. I oh, actually I'll probably okay. can't show it because it'll get me stripped off YouTube, so I won't do that. I'll just tell you about it. Okay. Um, and because they're best mates, you find out that if you look up Two Bears One Cave um, Kool Aid, um, basically one of them finds out that the other one drinks about four gallons of Kool Aid a day. And that turns into literally seven minutes because I looked at it and timed it of them two just pissing themselves laughing. And that's all they do. They laugh so hard for seven minutes and that's part of their content. So, you know, there's no there's no noble entity in I'm that. I'm guessing it's Bert that drinks that much Kool-Aid. Yeah, 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 yeah. you guessed right. Okay, yeah. um, and they do this often and it's like, it's so silly and it's so refreshing and it's so fun um, that, and it's something that they want to do. They're, they're best mates. They literally finish the podcast with saying, I love you, Bert. I love you, Tom. You know, that's what they say to each other. And I just, uh, you know, it's something they want to do. And they've found an audience. And, and like I said, part of me sometimes gets a bit jealous. Obviously, when you're based in the States and you're a successful uh, operator already, you have an audience. But I kind of go, oh, you know, we do talk to these interesting people. These guys are just fucking laughing for seven minutes. And it's the best thing in the world at the moment. <laughs> it's like that's all they have yeah, to do is totally. laugh. totally. And that it's unfiltered, I yeah. think, you know. Also, our tastes have changed. I think anything too overly produced and stuff, you know, that's not what people need. They're craving connection. They want, yeah, something like this where we're just chatting with no real agenda. And yeah, I think people feel like they're a fly on the wall or they're in the room with us. Nice. You mentioned, um, you know, being in America and not being there under Trump. It was interesting at the last election, there were a lot of celebrity type people in America saying, if Trump wins, I'm going to leave. And of course, none of them did. Um, 
you've got, have you got a, a lot of experience in America before Trump? And what do you see? What's the difference living over there kind of before and after? Um, I guess this, that question's kind of twofold. I think there's also, um, you know, me growing up a little bit more, uh, having more of an understanding of political interest. Um, I think that's part of it, you know, is the world more crazy or am I just paying more attention? Right, so right, there's right. that element to it. Um, yeah, which comes from a maturity standpoint, more of an educational standpoint of me being informed about, you know, issues and causes and movements and things that I feel really passionately about. And then when the elected president sits on the other side of that, that's, yeah, you know, Yeah, I, I guess it just it feels more poignant because I'm in disagreement with leadership. Whereas I can sit here, I'm a big fan of Jacinda. I love the way that she's handling everything. So yeah. it's not a cause of stress in my day. Um, whereas I'm sure if Judith was running things and would have a very different approach, that would probably, you know, spark me to feel more ignited and, you know, have that metallic taste in my mouth of every day feeling a little bit more at odds. So um, I think that's a big part of it. And yeah, I guess, I guess beforehand, you know, it, it, cause it, there's a big trickle down effect in the sense of the, the jobs that I like to work on are usually a little bit more edgy. There's a, a social message behind it we're pushing progression. And right. when Trump was elected, a lot of that content is now shifted. They're trying to appeal more to, um, and I'm stereotyping here, more to middle America, keeping things a little bit more PC, keeping the jokes at a level of funny that doesn't trigger me. I kind of get triggered <laughs> by like either weird or wacky or inappropriate, you know? So it's like, I think just even in terms of me as an actress, the content that I want to be part of is, is not, getting enough attention because it's become clear that a lot of the country isn't that way or or is not ideally wanting that kind of progression is, is that is that something you've seen that actual you know, like creation of content be it a film or tv or online has been yeah. impacted by trump's presidency oh, totally. wow. yeah so i um i shot a show with george lopez a pilot and it was uh set in a little bar in mexico where a bunch of americans had kind of fleed to because of trump's election and it was you know talking about this kind of expat community that have gone to um, Mexico and this was right around Trump being, well, just after Trump being elected and then the border war was a big discussion. So right, it was, right. you know, it was a show for ABC, the other side of the fence, essentially, um, looking at Amer America from an outsider's perspective and it should have gone. It had a great cast. That's not my ego talking. I was <laughs> the only the odd one out in the room, but you know, George Lopez is a huge star. He's well loved in not only the Latino community across the board. And um, we didn't get picked up. And they did another season of the Connors, you know, right as old what's her name's taking Ambien and yeah, Roseanne. Uh, Roseanne over over us. And that's that's not to say the show didn't have work to do, but when those are your options and you fall that way, then yes, the the work that I wanna do and the stories I wanna tell are not getting those green lights necessarily well i mean i guess there are i would have loved to have done a show with him he took me to a dodgers game and it was like oh, walking cool. with Moses because like the seas part because everyone just loves that man so much it was so i was like oh this is such a cool cocktail <laughs> like, we ended up in the dugout area wow. like, with all the breeze drinking tequila i spewed in his garden um because <laughs> i was so drunk because i I'm like old enough to know that I shouldn't be drinking anymore. But when George Lopez is handing you shots yeah. of like crazy expensive tequila, I don't have the, I'm just such a people pleaser. I'm like, I'll do it. I'll suffer later. Um, so we, we don't that. go, we don't quite go down that path here in the thing, but we do have the, uh, we do have the, the bottles ready when you're in the studio. So next time you come right. home, there's some nice Patty's whiskey there. Okay. That, that sits on there. We've got the beer fridge just here, which is uh, not as full as it usually is because so many of these things no, I'm doing by doing by myself. So, you know, but I had a beer yesterday well, I, with I Winston. Oh, that 
that is so nice of you. Yeah. I I'm not good on whiskey. I'm a very much um, a lightweight. Um, but I would have had a beer with you for sure. Uh, what about this one? Some vo- this one here. This is a nice Cadron of vodka. You have that one as well. This is amazing. This is amazing. Actually, that's got a. It's like banana infused. In fact, I haven't done this for a while. It's got a. It's got a tinge of banana. It smells like banana. It's amazing. Amazing. Okay. Shout out to Cadrona. Uh, the Cadrona. Shout out. Story. Yeah. Shout out. Got to try some. <laughs> um. Who else have you run into when you work in America? I mean, George Lopez is a huge name in com- comedy circles and acting circles. So who else have yeah. you run into? I've been very blessed, actually. I feel like I've definitely worked with um, some amazing people. I got to work with Stephen Fry, and he's just oh, uh, amazing. Um, I work regularly with Kevin Connolly. He's an executive producer of my podcast. He's um, from Entourage or The Notebook, depending on <laughs> the two circles of people that have an intense fandom of him. Um, yeah, Jamie Lynn Sigler. Um, oh, I just, yeah, I feel so lucky. There's been so many people that I'm able to, you know, now call my peers and, and work with them. And yeah, it's, it's a surreal feeling to be considered um a t- teammates with those kind of people with you know have you had anyone kind of had anyone that's caused your eyes to get big like comes in and i'll tell you my story a second but you've actually spoken to proper okay. famous people um like comes in and you go holy crap what am i supposed to do has that moment happened to you um yeah twice with will ferrell i just wanted him wow. to i wanted him to find me funny well the ideal scenario was that we have a bit of banter and he goes, you're hilarious. And then we become mates and then my life just unfolds before me and I'm in all of his movies. That was how I wanted it to go. <laughs> he was really pleasant, but there was no invitation of like post game. Um, and why I totally just blanked on his name because my brain does this to me. It's an asshole. Mm-hmm. Aaron, um, uh, Breaking Bad, um, Westworld. Aaron. Um, uh, uh, the uh, Jesse, the Jesse character. Yes. Jesse Pinkman. What is his name? I was it jumped out of my oh. head too. Isn't it funny that I can remember his name, uh, his actor's name, but I you can't can remember, remember his character I can name. His character's name. Aaron Paul. Thank you. Of course, two first names, never to be trusted. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I got to spend some time with him and I just, I knew where he was in the building at all times. I was just so hot in the pants for him and just so excited. (laughs) That same thing, I was like, had created this narrative. So of course, any experience I had was subpar to this fantasy version of, you know, us drinking his whiskey, is it that he has a company and I don't know, just being mates. Those are probably the two that I've been like the most... um, result oriented I, I have to say when I when I tell you my my much more minor version of yours I don't think the phrase hot in the pants comes to mind <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> really classy <laughs> my mother will be eye rolling if she watches this I think it's a great way to describe it though we don't us girls need to we need a way of describing it and I feel like that is definitely it's just a little pincy kind of feeling where you go oh ooh, excited great <laughs> Isn't it? We're in a funny. We're in a funny era now, post the Me Too era, where you can say that and you can get away with saying that. But if anyone else, if I said that, oh, so were you hot in the pants for Will Ferrell? It'd be like, okay, cancel culture coming out. You're done. No more. It's all right though, because nobody knows me. I can't get cancelled because I'm not famous. Only famous people get cancelled. So that's not true. Well, I but I'm I'm okay to say it about myself. I think that's like part of what true. You know. True. Where we're at in 2020. I can say anything about myself. You say something. But no, you have full permission to, to talk to me however you need to. I know you're a very respectable, upstanding citizen. It is, it is true, though. I mean, I think about, you think about when you're hanging out with your best mates, maybe more around school and university, you've got, you know, your circle and, your, you know, your, you're a dick and you're a this and you're a that. Every worst word in the world you call one another. But if an outsider to the circle calls that person that, you know, it's time to throw hands, as they say. It's on. So what how we treat ourselves and our, and our closest is very different. It's a funny thing, communication, isn't it? How we communicate yeah. with one another. Oh, and t- ourselves. Look. How we talk to ourselves. Yes. Is it when you've gone through that kind of depression and that anxiety sort of thing, is that is that something you learned about how you, the messages you give yourself? Yeah, I guess like my biggest takeaway from stuff that I've learned 
about and gaining my education around mental health is that everyone's brand of depression or anxiety is very different. I grew up with, you know, the movie version of depression, which is the can't get out of bed after a breakup kind of version we see in the movies. And I'm a very high functioning depressive. That's not me giving myself a pat on the back. That's me saying like my version of depression is almost like a mania of like fill every minute of every day. So you're not alone with your own thoughts. Distract, distract, distract. Yeah, yeah. Which means I'm very productive. Um, but yeah, my my brand of depression comes out as negative self-talk. So it's basically anything that I do is not good enough. More could have been done. Um, and yeah, just not really cutting myself any slack, which is it has been a good source of motivation to me. But it, it does mean that <clears throat> I don't offer myself that silence and that relaxed mind state of you did your best and that's enough. Mm-hmm. There's always, even at my very best, I, I I feel like there must have been some area I could have done more. So it's just not, yeah. So so what do you do now to, you know, to give yourself the right messages that don't take you down that path anymore? You, you must have an active sort of change in life to now that you've been through that. Like I've had, mm-hmm. I've had issues with addiction and stuff in my life. And one of the things that right. I've always think about is, and alcohol or just um, all, of everything. all sorts of stuff uh, for my whole life sure. I've treated food like an alcoholic treats alcohol um, that sort of mm-hmm. thing um, and I remember someone telling me of their experience through you know various step programs that the addictions always in the car park doing press-ups and that mm-hmm. stuck yeah. you're closer to your next drink than you were to your last kind of thing yeah so no matter what how good you feel about yourself not as a way to kind of say life is crap but you know it doesn't take much for that addiction or that whatever your thing is yeah. because it, it possibly is in the car park doing press ups means it, it could be getting stronger it could be you know getting better it could be and 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 that's been a message that i've received that i really um that comes to me a lot actually about how and and i'm not i'm not saying that i'm on necessarily on top of my own issues we all have issues at times but yeah, yeah that's something that i that i think about a lot about doing press ups in the press ups in the car park getting stronger that's which a is a really great way of putting it and yeah and i'm obviously thank you for for sharing that i think that that will resonate with a lot of people it definitely resonates with me in the sense that I kind of, when I got diagnosed, went into fix it mode. I thought that, that my depression was something I could fix. And I didn't realize that it's like, oh, no, it's it's something that I'm prone to. That doesn't mean that I, I could go years or whatever without having a depressive spell. But it's something that chemically I am prone to. And there are definitely things that I can be actively doing to not give myself the environment to make that um, pop up or at least uh, catch it before it gets to, um, consuming. So for me, um, sleep has been a big thing for me. So if, um, I run on adrenaline, I have anxiety. So if I'm working all the time, I'm great. And as soon as I stop working, I'm still creating that adrenaline and then I can't sleep and sleep is really important. A lack of sleep will, is a real it's like a gateway drug to me to all the other things surfacing because i'm at a point of exhaustion that means that i'm too exhausted to take care of myself in some really basic human things like feeding myself Mm. right i'm too exhausted to go for a walk or to go outside so i start creating an environment where my depression like a little virus or leech is like oh we're gonna grow and get bigger now you've created the perfect little petri dish for us to thrive and in the last like two weeks I've been having a lot of sleep issues um, just lying awake at night and that's a real breeding ground for me so I've had like some physical ailments that have come up in this last week from a lack of sleep I've definitely felt more bitey I've noticed these spiraling thoughts coming back and it's it's less about a triggering event it's more about the lack of sleep has created this environment for me to kind of take a few steps back in my progress and growing in education has been really helpful to me to like flag it Mm -hmm. and also understand that my brain in its wonderful ways is really capable of telling me lies and providing evidence to support those lies and so that's a really scary thing to know that you know if I was to say or have a thought that 
pet you don't like me or you're only bringing this on me on to like shaft me or something then i would be able to bring bring up a bunch of evidence of like other radio interviews where that's or and it's none of it is true or happening but my brain is so overactive it can pull all these other and then create a really shitty time for myself and yeah yeah learning that those thoughts aren't facts and to try and intervene and police them before they become these great what turns into a day could turn into a week of me going like, oh, no one likes me. Everyone's just, you know, or whatever that thought is that then as soon as I give it any attention goes massive. Um, do you yeah. know, do you know about Occam's razor? Occam's razor is a theory. Not. Occam's razor is okay. a theory that basically I'm, I'm, I'm going to butcher it, but it basically says the most obvious um, the, the most likely outcome is more often than not the correct outcome. Apparently they use it in things like murder trials, but basically they, they say the most likely person to have committed this crime more often than not is the person that's committed the crime. Right? Not always, mm. but more often than not. And I often think mm. that the, the telling yourself stories, I have conversations with people all the time, including myself, and I stop and mm. I go, okay, what's the most likely outcome here? What's the most likely outcome you know, uh, for Kim, is it that I I want to have her on because I don't like her? Well, no. no. You know, what's the most no. like? There's reasons for it because she's an interesting and you know uh, inspiring person to have a conversation with, with so much, so many facets to her life that I just want to get to know this person over sixty minutes. And you know, actually, there's a comment on on Facebook right now. Why aren't more people watching this? It's dope, and because other people oh, want to want to hear it as well. Um, but I was going to say to you, um, do you actively kind of keep an eye on your sleep? Is it something you do? This is really fascinating because literally this has been something I've never really had trouble with sleep before. And you, it's, it's something that's happened in the last two weeks, which has coincided with lockdown after a very busy season of me working all the time. Right. So I had put all... For me, I catastrophize. So I put all this pressure on myself, like lockdown, great. I'm about to start on a new movie. I've got two weeks. I will get my fitness going. I'll calm down because I've been operating up here. And what's happened is I put all my pressure on this two weeks being really productive and really healthy. And I've not been sleeping. So that productivity is getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I've, um, I did, I wore my dad's Fitbit to only then be informed that, oh, I'm not just kind of not sleeping. I'm really not sleeping. Like, <laughs> you know, and I've, you know, had, I said physical ailments, like I had a sore stomach, I was coughing up blood, like two weeks without any real sleep is a, like, it's really unhealthy. Yeah. Um, and I have a lot of pride. So I was like, oh, hold off calling the doctor or my psychologist. I should be able to fix this. And Anyway, last night I, well, yesterday I had talk, spoken to my psychologist and spoken to my GP and I got prescribed some melatonin to take. Um, and I've always seen medication as a sense of my own personal failure because I should be able to do the list of things without it. Took a melatonin last night, went to bed at nine, woke up at five because I had to, had a wonderful night's sleep and feel a world of difference yeah. today. So. Look, I, yeah, I, I so think there's a lot in that to unpack. But yes, yeah, sleep is just really important. And if it means that, you know, melatonin is natural and it mm. is safe. Um, it's it's just, yeah, a combination of me learning to medicate and dealing with my ego at the same time are quite uh, a difficult. I think I think mel melatonin is a fascinating one. I've got um, someone, in, yeah. a friend in Dunedin who has a science background. And I can't remember whether, whether she said she takes it or she knows of lots of people in Dunedin who do take it come winter. Because there are parts of Dunedin that right. don't get much sun. You know, there are parts of Dunedin yeah. that get no sun in the winter. So um, right. so so they take it as a way to stave off depression. Um, I was going to say, I'm uh, uh, much like you, I'm my sleep is interesting. So I've just downloaded uh, this app called Sleepwatch and um, it tracks. Okay. So that's that's my sleep last night. You can okay. see the red things are where I um, was awake, like stirred yeah. in the night. Uh huh. And then it tells me what I slept, and it tracks me through the the Apple okay, Watch. Yeah. And it's something that I've started to take more seriously more recently. And it um mm -hmm. it sort of gives you all the results. And I remember um when we had our what's well, a good way to check in, right? And yeah. go like oh, because yeah, you are you are more. 
yeah, I mean, we need sleep. Unfortunately, as someone with busy lady syndrome, this idea of productivity and like, I only get, you know, all the greats that I follow. It's like, I only see for four hours a night. And I'm like, well, if they can do it and run a, you know, do whatever they're doing, uh, Elon Musk or someone like that. I'm like, he's the smartest man. He only sleeps that much. But like, for me, I need more than that. Otherwise the wheels fall off in various areas. So. I, I remember um, having our first child with my then partner. Um, we had a midwife who, and this, okay, let me just preface this by saying this is not medical advice. <laughs> I don't want anyone okay. to hear this and think, oh, Pat yeah. said, not medical advice. Um, but she was a, a pretty experienced midwife and she used to be the, the head midwife at Auckland Hospital. And so she'd been doing it for 30 plus years. You know, one of her, mm -hmm. um, I was going to say claim to fame, just the wrong way to say it. One of the things she, um, put us at ease with which she'd never lost a baby which which we have a very low rate of you know uh, newborn uh, mortality but she was someone who'd never done that and I'll never forget she told us about sleep for us um, she said that you have postnatal depression has exactly the same symptoms as someone who is sleep deprived and extremely sleep deprived and mm -hmm. so the point she was making was not it wasn't talking against postnatal depression. It was talking to the importance of getting new, uh, good sleep when you had a newborn, no matter how, because it's got some pretty shocking um, yeah. uh, results on your body if you don't look after yourself in that way. And I've always remembered that and tried my best to do sleep, but I do like working late nights. I do like getting off the computer at 11 o'clock, finishing my day. What? Well, that's all right. You just need to find some more time to sleep in. Or I used to be an afternoon napper. It used to be nothing I liked more than an afternoon nap. Just lie on the couch for like seven minutes, ten minutes sleep. But when I do that, then I'm up till one thirty. So I've got to, I don't do that anymore. And I just, I just try and set my routine. And yes, I I work at night. I like I was the, I was the guy at university who worked from you know eleven p.m. till four a.m. Did all those writing and that kind of stuff. Then that was my natural rhythm. So. Yeah, no, I don't know, but yeah, sleep. Who thought? Who who would have thought you would have come on here and talked about sleep for fifteen minutes, eh? Well, it's important. I think it is very important to talk about, and it's it's very present in my week currently. So it's right at the forefront. So, yeah. Um, I was going to say um, I was going to enjoy playing this for you. This is from your own uh, YouTube channel, so I'm sure I'll get away with it. But also for everyone else, uh, a little bit of experience of you on. Uh, on Shorty Street, mostly, oh, be God. mostly because I like the the line that comes out. Forget the oh, magic I already eyes. know on. what it is. There's only one <laughs> dick here. <laughs> I know you don't. There's only oh, one dick way. here. Love that line. Don't you dare! You're a disgusting pig, Orlando Gun. What's your problem apart from your face and your tiny brain? Well, what's your problem? <laughs> apart from being tiny. That's fantastic. I love it. They must be. They must be. Because you were what seventeen when you started there. I was 16. Yeah, I started in 2005. Good six and a half years. So. And I, I, I hear from people. I mean, I think all of New Zealand's been on Shortland Street at some stage. I've been on it in, as three different characters. And the most hilarious thing was, um, you know how I don't know if they still do it, but at one stage, like over Christmas, they'd show. Or there was like repeats in the morning, but it was six months ago. So they had the new ones at oh, seven. Yeah. And um, my then little sister-in-law saw me in the morning playing one character and in the evening playing the other one, which was oh, kind of hilarious. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> but, um, you know, from people who have done it for real, not like us pretend people, um, I hear it's, a, it's like a really good university of acting, real good skills, real good foundation. Yeah. Have, you, have you found that? Has it been something that's, you know, that foundation has helped you move through and get to where you want to go? Yeah, I think it's, it, honestly, I have only wonderful things to say about my experience there. And um, yeah, it really set me up for success because you're working all day, every day, and you are learning, you know, while it's recording and while it's happening. So, <laughs> um, and you only get a few shots at everything. So in terms of scenes and things. So no, I, I am very complimentary of my time there. And you know, it was just because I felt that pull to go to America and try something else that I made the decision to leave. And, and I stand by that. I felt like at that time for my level of maturity, I had learned everything I could have learned in that environment. Um, but yeah, I just, yeah, I 
recommend if if you are an actor like get on that show it's if, do what you can to be on it because it's not only brilliant but it is a, a great education yeah as sort of an alumni of shortland street um mm-hmm. do you then find that there's lots of opportunities and offers coming across the table from other new zealand productions yeah i was really i was really lucky that um you know, I, I was uh, diversifying my palette, as it were, doing some different things. A lot of people do leave Shorten Street and there used to be this like two year curse people would speak about where you can't get cast in anything else because everyone only thinks of you as one thing. I was really, really um, adamant early on in my time in Shorten Street that that wouldn't be the case for me. So I started doing some hosting. I tried to build myself up as a brand as Kimberly Crossman versus Sophie Mackay um, by starting a website and blogs and working on uh, what was then the Bill and Ben show, like Jono and Ben and, and yeah, just trying to get my finger in other pies, which is something that apparently only New Zealanders say. Oh, really? <laughs> um, well, I've said it in a meeting before, I've got fingers and pies. And everyone was like, um, balls in the air. They're like, geez, everything's sexual with this chick. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I, I have been lucky. I will say I've been lucky, but I also very intentionally have tried to build relationships outside of Shulton Street while I was still on Shulton Street to ensure that I would have, you know, a, a career in this nice. strange well, you, you speak about the, the website that you've started. I'd like to know more about it. Let's um let's bring it up for people to to have a look at. Um, it's called Joyable, yeah. And oh yeah, so I, yeah, I have a. This is a business my sister and I started. So it's a crowdfunding. It's essentially the same model of uh, give a little, but instead it's it's more about gifting. So if you know, if it was you had a big birthday coming up, we could all go in and, and pitch in to get you something that's more memorable rather than, you know, a candle or some beer. You know, maybe you want to go to a concert or in post-COVID times, you know, maybe you want an <laughs> iPad and that would help you do your show better. And so the idea is, is that you can get people to contribute towards one gift rather than receiving lots of gifts. And it was a came from the mind of my amazing sister who has three children who, and you might relate having children, ends up with a ton of plastic that ends up in landfill that is just shitty gifts with the best intentions, but they're not memorable. They're not, you know, special. And and she was actively buying those for friends as well. So this is kind of a cool way. And it's really easy to use. You know, you can send a link out to everyone, family, friends overseas. A lot of people are using it for their wedding registry because they would right. rather have cash than... 10 platters um yeah so it's, it was really cool that, that's what i was going to ask you i was going to ask you about the wedding so let's say a newly married couple wants to do honeymoon in fiji you could put the fiji mm-hmm. experience flights package sort mm-hmm. of thing on here and then people mm-hmm. could just contribute to it and and yeah. from the end as much as little they want as well which is cool from the end of the you guys making it do you then charge a a percentage to, is it like it's got to make money as well how does it work for what's yeah, the model we just charge, a, charge a service fee for for processing so yeah so that's how we make money but yeah obviously obviously that is the goal in creating a business but yeah. i think for us too it's like that joy and it's and seeing people have great gifts out of the end of it is really is really cool and heartwarming and yeah, and we use it all the time, obviously, within our own family. So, and it's still alert. it's still going. Like, how many people would use it each year? How much? How, how much? Um, how much traction does it get? Yeah, yeah. So a lot. Um, it slowed down a little bit, obviously, over COVID. Um, but yeah, obviously, leading up to things like Father's Day has been really big for us this month. Um, and I think too, people are looking for a way that they can still connect with people when mm. perhaps maybe experiences are are off the table, like concerts, but. A lot of cool local things, and people want stuff. So yeah, it would seem that, that will never end. it would seem that ultimately um, this kind of website, if you could then also tap into the suppliers, and then you know make deals, special deals for your website to then give to the guys, that would be that would be the the dream scenario. Like if they could come on there and get a yeah. you, you're talking about experiences, so getting an all black package to the next game that they can't get anywhere else. That'd be the way to make it scream, eh? You want to step on as our um, step in as advisor? Do you want to <laughs> come to our next AGM? I like this idea. <laughs> no, yeah, we're definitely working on that now. Yeah. Um, my sister is spearheading it, obviously. Um, 
but yeah, that's th- those things are well in the works of becoming possible. So yeah, so it's kind of like you are you become a shop front. A shop front on one level, but also on the other level, a place that people can put their own wares, which is their own products as well. Hey, yeah. um, tell me about um, tell me about making horror films. That must be something that's pretty exciting. I love making horror films. This is from Deathgasm. Oh, I love it. This is one of my favorite experiences. I don't get to wield that an axe brilliant. often. Thank you been a lot of time practicing that it feels very much it feels very much like um early pete jackson you know that kind of bad not not i mean much better production values but very much that kind of um that bad Mm -hmm. taste sort of splatterish to it i love it that's exactly what it exactly what it is you nailed it you're obviously a horror fan um yeah jason lee howden he just just did guns akimbo as well which comes out i think on sky this week or next week is his uh follow-up movie to deathgasm but we're hoping for a deathgasm too because it did really well in the states and it's got this little cult culture around it which is really special do you still have that in uh in america i i know that kiwis were very hot for a very long time kind of started by lord of the rings and kind of followed up by um you know the flight of the concord seemed to open roads for a lot of people is that still the feeling around sort of hollywood that new zealand is a, are a special breed yeah i think uh, unfortunately because i usually end up playing a sister or a daughter in film i usually have to use a u.s accent in television um of recent times and you know thanks to the likes of reese darby who who will only use his own accent um and people have become a little bit more aware of our accent and can understand it then yeah there's definitely been more opportunities in the last two years for people allowing me to use my native accent and hire me for that reason for a little bit of diversity still white but (laughs) you know depending on what their realm is um of what they're doing so that's been really cool. But yeah, more often than not, I have to do an American accent still. Um, it's interesting seeing it coming up in other other uh, programs. Have you seen uh, the new uh, Legions of Monkey? Josh, I uh, haven't. Uh, I love Josh. Yeah. Yeah, and and he and obviously it's an it's an Australian New Zealand production, but most of the leads are using uh, American accents. But Josh is in there using his Kiwi accent as Pixie. Or, I mean, I don't I, I don't remember the original. I am that's the one thing in the world that I am might be too young for. Um, I I remember seeing it in repeats. Um, but yeah, he obviously I don't know if it's something he's got in his contract. It's interesting you say Reese Darby refuses to. Is that a contractual thing? He basically says. I won't do an American accent. I've never heard that before. Um, so I interviewed him for my podcast, and he definitely he didn't allude to it being contractual. He just said that he he wouldn't like. And and I do feel like his voice is so um, him mm. that I think that that is you know probably part of the reason people employ him is for that voice. That you know, uh, oh oh no, yeah, um, it's it's what he brings to it. So yeah, I. I'm not sure actually if it is contractual or that he just won't deviate from that. Yeah. So in other words, people aren't going to hire him to do an American accent is what you're saying, whether it be contractual or not, they're going to hire him because they want that Reese Darby voice. That actual, as, yeah, as you're saying. So. Yeah. But it was, it's nice to hear Josh. Nice to hear Josh's uh, Kiwi lilt in that. As I said, I'd, I saw repeats of the original monkey. I never saw the original when it was around. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's a cool series. I'm halfway through it on Netflix. I'm loving it actually. Awesome. You should watch Gangs of London or The Great on Neon. They are divine if you need something to binge. What else? What else are you watching at the moment? What's on your uh, binge list? What have you picked up on, especially during lockdown when most people, yeah. although you've talked about being too busy, but most people have picked up you know, one or two new things to watch? Yeah, well, Gangs of London is definitely, I watched it uh, last weekend. It is so good, uh, especially if you don't mind a lot of violence. Uh, it's got a lot of the cast from Peaky Blinders and Game of Thrones in it. It's so good. Um, the Great is what my family and I are watching, one episode a night at the moment. Uh, it's also on Neon about Catherine the Great, who marries the Russian emperor, and it's so fucking funny. It's so good. Yeah. Um, good laugh, but also a period piece, so my mother gets excited about the costume, so it's a bit something for everyone. Um, what else have I been watching? I just started watching Shit's Creek, um very obviously last cab off the rank there with me i don't know what was stalling me previously i just 
hadn't gotten into it and so i've been watching that and i think that's really great it's good passive watching because you can kind of come and go um and other than that i spend the majority of my time if i am ingesting content it's usually podcasts it's usually Dak Shepard, Joe Rogan, um, or selfishly editing my own, which is, you know, passive and involved in, in listening back on stuff. Um, yeah, and I think those are good. What I like about Dax and Joe and, and possibly in uh, Bert and Tom's one as well, I'm just a very curious person. So I love, I, I'm less uh, interested in the actors they talk to and more interested in the experts. If I know nothing about bees and suddenly I want to know everything about bees, that is something as a curious conversationalist, probably like yourself, that I go, I if I start by going, I didn't know that or I know nothing about that, then I'm usually all in. So that's, yeah, a real guilty pleasure of mine. Yeah, well, coming in, uh, in an hour. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm 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 similar in lots of ways. Being in Dunedin, of course, with uh, university being here, uh, up until lockdown, probably a third, 30, 35% of the podcasts we did were academics that were associated mm -hmm. with the university, either that they were at the university or I keep a very close eye on who's coming through. Um, mm -hmm. and, and getting people on board because yeah, it's, it's, I love, I love being the dumbest person in the room, you know? Oh, me too. It's my favorite <laughs> thing. Oh. And I love being, um, able to open the door for people to tell mm -hmm. their stories. So I see why someone's coming through and he's talking about, uh, the relationship of Shakespeare to X, Y, Z and how it relates to, you know, jazz music. And I'm like, that just sounds, I, I that's enough for me. Come and talk to me. Yeah. And, and they do, you know? That's so cool. Yeah, I love that. I think it's such a humbling experience. And yeah, you're right. I enjoy being informed about something that I have little to no knowledge about. And I hope that that continues. That's something that I also really admire in other people. So I yeah. think I think it's also cool for, I mean, obviously you create your own content. To have that attitude, and I guess not, again, to kind of blow my own trumpet. I'm not trying to do that. But um, yeah, I like opening doors for other people to tell their stories. And I like... Mm -hmm. Like I was talking to the Right Honourable Winston Peters yesterday and um, mm -hmm. I knew halfway through the conversation that he was giving long answers and I was letting him. And I said to him at the end, I didn't want to, and I was going to mention the name of a journalist and someone mm -hmm. messaged me through and said, you were thinking of Tove O'Brien, weren't you? And I was. I was going to say to him, I, I didn't want to tover you, meaning let you say 10 words and then cut you off and then give you another one. And it, it's sort of what I wanted to do, especially coming up to the election, I think it's important. And then I, mm -hmm. I for people who are watching this that may not be aware, this also becomes an audio podcast and I top and tail it with an intro and an outro. And I basically said in the outro, look, if you didn't, if you didn't find that too cut and thrust enough, uh, well, fuck off then. It's what I wanted to do. And if you didn't like it, go make your own podcast. But it's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to give space. And I think after about 20 minutes, he kind of went, oh. and then he realized he had time to actually talk and chat. And hopefully the other leaders will take up the uh, mental and come through and do it as well. So, yeah. Have that's... you had um, uh, Chloe Swarbrick on? No, but I've had Marama on twice. Okay. Um, and that was kind of cool because actually there's a Shortland Street story there because um, Rawari actually... I had a moment with Rawari at Shortland Street where he basically coached me. And it's just like for everyone, I'm just like, ah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that He's was so cool. Rad. I just worked with him on Golden Boy. What a legend. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I've actively stayed away from um, MPs that aren't leaders for the last six months. I've okay. invited the leaders and I've said it's an election year. And some of them have said, oh, we're probably too busy. Probably can't do it. Would you like another MP? And I've said, no. I said, because okay. for the election year, I'm thinking leaders or no one. Whereas next year, there might be lots of opportunities to talk to individually in peace. So, yeah, for this year, though, it's it might be the wrong decision by me. But I'm like, if this party is going to give me the time to speak to their leader and this party is, and that party wants to give me a, you know, no offense to them, but like a mid-level bencher, I'll, I'll yeah. leave that for this year, maybe get back to it next year. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. But you know, I'm I, I as people know who listen or watch my content, I I intravenously take political news. Uh, I wake up every morning and check to see if Trump's blowing up the top half of the world and 
you know, watch everything online and, and, and ingest. You were so saying, most mornings you're like, oh, yep, he has. Well, on some level, he tends to do it most days. It's the hilarious thing about him is every day he does something that in any other presidency would be a scandal enough to get them removed, but he seems to do one every day and everyone just goes, ah, it's, that's today's. Can't do much about that. That's today's. So, yeah, it's a fascinating time. And it's going to be a fascinating election. And obviously, odds are, polls are saying at the moment that he won't get back in. Um, we'll see. I think after the last election with Trump, everyone's a bit gun shy about adhering to the polls. But in, in saying that, the polls weren't wrong last time because the polls that were put out about Clinton winning were the nationwide polls. And they say that she would have won the popular vote by 3%. And she won it by 2.1%. She got 3 million more votes. People just equated that to winning the presidency. That's where they got it wrong. Yeah. So we'll see. Are you, are you obviously over there a lot? If, it's, if it was a normal year, what would your time split be between the US and New Zealand? Yeah, so usually it's a 70, 30, 70% in the States. Um, this last The last two years, it's been very much 50, 50. Um, and part of that reason is employment and part of that reason is my green card to maintain my green card i have to spend 50 percent of my time in the year in the states right um which will mean if that is something based on the election that i want to continue to do then i will need to go back this year to to make up another couple like seven weeks of of days on the ground even so. even during COVID, though they want to keep the like there's no well well, do you imagine under the current administration that they'll go, oh, foreigner, you weren't here. Yeah, yes, true. that's fine. You can come back. No, they'll yeah, go, yeah. sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, I, I'm, I'm totally speculating, but it's just better to, you know, keep my side of the bed clean if, if that is something that I want to do. So. Um, and does the green card give you voting rights over there or not? No, I'm not a citizen. I can't oh. apply for citizenship for another 18 months. So, yeah, I'm not allowed to vote. Hey, um, Kimberly Crossman, we're coming up yes. to three o'clock. I don't know so quickly. Is there anything else you wanted to dive into? Oh my gosh, I don't know. We've done, it's, it's, I always, when people ask me, what's your podcast about? I kind of go, I oh, just having interesting chats about things with interesting people. Yeah. And especially when people offshore want to know more about it. I, and I might've sent this through to you guys. I, I typically send them a clip that I did with Terada. And with Radar, we got 40, and I've known Radar for a long time. We used to work for Theatre Sports Auckland together and be neighbours in, in central Auckland. Um, and I sent through a clip, and me and Radar are chatting away. 45 minutes into the conversation, he goes, so, what are we going to talk about today, Pat? It's like, well, we've we've kind of already been doing it. So, <laughs> That's I'm, great. That's so good. So, well, I saw you talk to AJ Hackett, too, who I think is really cool. So, uh, I'm yeah, so, you definitely I, had some and he wins I'm the, the I think I've, I've said this before, but he wins the award, at, if you haven't heard that one yet, he wins the award for um, shutdown uh, holiday. He got he got stuck in, at, 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 at as he describes it, at one of our resorts. I'm assuming that means they own the whole resort with all of his kids and no customers for four months in Thailand. So he he wins. <laughs> Hands down, he wins. What a dream! Yeah, and he said oh. he said that he got his diving ticket while he was there on lockdown, and that they employed yeah, all it. they employed all of the staff. They kept them all on, but what they did was completely sort of tidy up and revamp the resort. But when it comes to lockdown um, experiences, I think AJ yeah. wins. I think he wins. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much for chatting to us today. It has been. Um, Amazing. Thank you for sharing some of that stuff as well, you know, about mental health and that sort of thing. I think it's important for people to know. And what we want to do here is, is provide a place for, uh, I don't know if you have talked about that much at all. I'm sure you have. But we want to have a space where people can talk about stuff that they don't normally talk about. Or if people see you on screen, they, you know, hear things that they don't know or don't normally know. So I really do genuinely appreciate you opening up and sharing some about that. It was uh, amazing. And uh yeah, well, when you win your first Oscar, I hope you still answer our emails because we'd love to talk to you then as well. Well, you know I'm high functioning, so <laughs> I will be up. <laughs> I'm always checking, always checking. No, I, I really, yeah, I really, I really do appreciate that. It's um, yeah, it's not easy or sometimes fun to like share your dirty laundry and put it out there. But yeah, I guess if I've learned anything in this last year that I have been talking about it, it's it's cathartic for me to do it, and it is helpful because 
part of the reason I was so alone and didn't seek help was because no one was talking about it in a way that I related to. Um, and yeah, I guess, I guess in hope and shining a little bit of lightness on it, then mm. there's no darkness anymore. It's all out there. So well, yay fun. <laughs> I heard someone once say about light and dark that the, the, there's two sayings that I like to think of and that sunlight's the best disinfectant. I use that a lot. The second nice. one is when you walk into a dark room and you turn on a light, the darkness doesn't kind of go, okay, I'll just slowly move away. It's like, bam, instantaneously it's gone. So once you turn on that light, once there's light in the dark room, there can be no darkness and it leaves instantly. So I think that your um, your metaphor there or your idea there is completely right. And I don't know, thanks again for joining us and thanks for sharing. It's been a blast. Yeah, thank you. You're doing wonderful work. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me as a guest. Mwah. Love you. I get to say I love you. We can be like Pat. Oh, like, like, like <laughs> we can Bruce. be like Brett and Tom. All right. Love you, Kim. I love you, Pat. <laughs>